Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll walk through a common problem in strength of materials. A compound bar subjected to both a temperature change and an external axial force. By the end of this session, you will be able to first, calculate the thermal stresses in a compound bar due to a temperature change. Second, determine the stresses caused by an external load. And finally, combine these two effects to find the total resultant stresses. Let's begin by breaking down the problem statement. We have a compound bar made of a steel rod and a copper tube. They are of the same initial length, 1.2 meters, and are rigidly fixed at their ends. This fixed condition is very important, as it will prevent the materials from expanding freely when heated, causing stress. We are given the cross-sectional area of the steel rod as 500 square millimeters, which is 500 times 10 to the minus 6 square meters. The copper tube has an area of 900 square millimeters, or 100 times 10 to the minus 6 square meters. The material properties are also provided. The modulus of elasticity for steel, ES, is 210 gigapascals, and for copper, EC is 105 gigapascals. The coefficient of thermal expansion for steel, alpha S, is 12 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree Celsius, and for copper, alpha C is 18 times 10 to the minus 6 per degree Celsius. Notice that copper expands more than steel for the same temperature change. We have two main questions to answer. Question 2.1 asks us to find the magnitude and nature of the stresses in the copper and steel if the temperature is increased from 30 to 95 degrees Celsius. This is a purely thermal stress problem. Question 2.2 asks for the resultant stresses. If on top of the temperature increase, we also apply an axial tensile force of 60 kN to the entire compound bar. Here, we'll combine the thermal stresses with those from the external load. Now that we've outlined the problem, let's start with the first part. Let's tackle question 2.1. The magnitude and nature of the thermal stresses when the temperature is increased. We need to find the stresses in the steel and copper bars when the temperature rises. The first step is to calculate the change in temperature, delta T. The temperature change is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So, 95 degrees minus 30 degrees gives us a temperature change of 65 degrees Celsius. Now, let's think about what happens. If the bars were free to expand, the change in length of each material would be, for steel, the thermal expansion would be alpha ES times the original length L times delta T. For copper, it would be alpha C times L times delta T. However, the ends are rigidly fixed, which means the total length of the compound bar must remain constant. Neither bar can expand freely. Since copper has a higher coefficient of thermal expansion than steel, copper would want to expand more. But because they are fixed together, copper is prevented from expanding fully, putting it into compression. Conversely, the steel wants to expand less than the copper. But it's being pulled along by the copper, which wants to expand more. This puts the steel into tension. So we expect the copper to be under compression and the steel under tension. We can set up two key equations based on this rigid constraint and equilibrium. First, the change in length for steel must be equal to the change in length for copper. Second, because the system is fixed, the internal forces must balance out to zero. The force in the steel must be equal and opposite to the force in the copper. Now the total change in length for each material is its free thermal expansion minus the contraction caused by the force that builds up. So for steel, the total length change is the thermal expansion term, alpha SL delta T, minus the term FL divided by ESAS, which is the contraction from the tensile force. For copper, the total length change is the thermal expansion term, alpha CL delta T, minus the term FL divided by ECAC, which is the compression from the compressive force. We can see that the length L is on both sides of the equation, so we can divide it out. This simplifies our equation to alpha S delta T minus F over E S A S equals alpha S C delta T minus F over E I C A C. Now we need to solve for the force F. Let's rearrange the equation to group the terms with F on one side. Moving the F terms to the left and the delta T terms to the right, we get F times the quantity 1 over ESAS plus 1 over ERC, AIC, equals the quantity alpha or C minus alpha S times delta T.
This is the general formula for finding the force in a compound bar due to temperature change. Now, let's plug in our numbers. We have F times 1 over the product of ES and AS plus 1 over the product of EIC and AC equals the difference in alpha values times 65. Let's simplify the terms inside the parentheses first. The denominator for the steel term is 210 times 500 equals 105,000. For copper, 105 times 900 is 94,500. On the right, the difference is 6 times 10 to the minus 6. Now we can calculate the numbers. 1 divided by 105,000 is approximately 9.52 times 10 to the minus 6. 1 divided by 94,500 is about 10 phosphate times 10 to the minus 6. The right side is 390 times 10 to the minus 6. Adding the terms on the left side and solving for F. The sum is 20.1 times 10 to the minus 6. So F equals 390 divided by 20.1. This gives us F equals 19,397 newtons, or 19,397 kilonewtons. So we found the force. Now we can find the stresses. Stress, sigma, is force divided by area. For steel, the stress is 19,397 divided by its area, which is 500 times 10 to the minus 6. This gives 38,794,000 pascals, or 38,794 megapascals. As we predicted, it's in tension. For copper, the stress is 19,397 divided by its area, 900 times 10 to the minus 6. This is 21,552,000 ,5 pascals, or 21.552 megapascals. This is in compression. And there you have it for part 2.1. We have successfully calculated the magnitude and nature of the thermal stresses. Let's recap what we did. We used the principle of compatibility, which states that the total change in length must be the same for both materials, and the principle of equilibrium, that the internal forces must balance. By solving for the force, we were able to find the stresses in both the steel and copper bars. Now let's move on to question 2.2. Finding the resultant stresses when we add an axial tensile force to the temperature change. In this part, an additional force of 60 kN is applied. We are finding the final or resultant stresses in the copper and steel. The beauty of this problem is that we can use the principle of superposition. This means we can find the stresses caused by the external force and simply add them to the thermal stresses we calculated in question 2.1 to get the total. Let's first calculate the stresses caused by the external tensile force which we'll call sigma prime. To do this, we need to determine how the external force is distributed between the steel and copper. We'll again use our two key principles. The principle of compatibility tells us that the strain, or change in length per unit length, in the steel is equal to the strain in the copper. The principle of equilibrium tells us that the total external force of 60 kN is carried by the steel and copper together. Let's start with the compatibility condition. We know that stress equals E times strain. This means that strain equals stress divided by E. So we can say that the stress in the steel, sigma S prime, divided by E S is equal to the stress in the copper, sigma S C prime, divided by E I C. Let's plug in the moduli of elasticity. We get sigma S prime over 210 times 10 to the 9th equals sigma C prime over 105 times 10 to the 9th. This simplifies to sigma S prime equals 2 times sigma C prime. This is our compatibility equation. Now let's use the equilibrium equation. Force equals stress times area. The total force of 60,000 newtons is equal to the stress in the steel times its area, plus the stress in the copper times its area. This gives us our equilibrium equation. We now have a system of two equations and two unknowns. We can solve for sigma C prime by substituting our compatibility equation into our equilibrium equation. Since we know sigma SS prime equals 2 sigma C prime, we can replace it in the equilibrium equation. This gives us 2 sigma C prime times AS plus sigma C prime times AC equals 60,000. Factoring out sigma C prime, we get sigma C prime times the quantity 2 AS plus AC equals 60,000. Now we can solve for sigma C prime. Sigma C prime is 60,000 divided by 2 times the area of steel plus the area of copper. Plugging in the areas, 
we get sigma c prime equals 60,000 divided by 1.9 times 10 to the minus 3. This gives us 31,579 megapascals. It's a positive value, so it's a tensile stress. Now we can find sigma hs prime using our compatibility relation. It's 2 times sigma c prime, which is 2 times 31.579. This gives us 63.158 megapascals, also in tension. So now we have all the pieces. We have the thermal stresses from 2.1 and the stresses from the external load. For steel, the thermal stress was 38.794 megapascals in tension, and the stress from the external load is 63.158 megapascals, also in tension. Since they are both tension, we add them together to get the total resultant stress. 10.952 megapascals still in tension. For copper, the thermal stress was 21.552 megapascals in compression. We can represent this with a negative sign. The stress from the external load is 31.579 megapascals in tension. The total is negative 21.552 plus 31.579, which gives us a positive 10.027 megapascals. The positive sign indicates the final resultant stress is in tension. And that concludes our walkthrough of the second part of the problem. We used the principle of superposition to combine the stresses from temperature and axial load finding the distribution of the load based on compatibility and equilibrium. Let's quickly recap what we have accomplished and the key concepts we used. The problem involved a compound bar made of two different materials with different thermal expansion and elastic properties. We started with a temperature change. Because the ends were fixed, the difference in thermal expansion between steel and copper caused internal forces. The copper, which expands more, was put into compression and the steel, which expands less, was put into tension. We used two fundamental principles to solve for the thermal stresses. First, we applied the principle of compatibility, which stated that the total change in length of the steel must equal the total change in length of the copper. Second, we used the principle of equilibrium, which stated that the forces in the two bars must be equal and opposite. We then solved for the internal force and calculated the resulting stresses in each material. The steel was in tension, and the copper was in compression, as expected. For the second part of the question, we introduced an additional external tensile force. Here we use the powerful principle of superposition. We analyzed the external load separately. The key was to figure out how this load was shared between the steel and copper. Again, compatibility and equilibrium were our guiding stars. This time, compatibility told us the strain was the same in both materials and equilibrium stated that the total force was the sum of the forces in the steel and copper. We used these to find the stresses caused by the say kilonewton load, which were both in tension. Finally, we combined our results. We took the stresses from the temperature change and algebraically added them to the stresses from the external force. For steel, both were tension, so we added them. For copper, the thermal stress was compression and the external stress was tension, so we subtracted them to find the net effect. We have now successfully walked through this complex problem step by step. You are now able to calculate thermal stresses, find the stress distribution in a compound bar under axial load, and combine these effects using superposition to find the final resultant stresses. Thank you for watching.